so um, maybe I'm a bit of the wild card um, on the panel today because I am not a scientist, <laughs> but um, I am um, in my head I am and I would love to be and um, I'm still working on it and that's the important thing. Um, so I kind of wanted to talk to you today a little bit about um, bioplastics, biomaterials and how it connects into the circular economy. Um, if you do want to get in contact with me um, or any of the work that I'm talking about or any of the network, then um, I've got my details there, but you can also just um, find me by my Insta handle or also um, the one of the companies I work for is Materium and you can find um, contact me by uh, them as well. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, I have a current, um, my current research, I sort of am doing teaching, mentoring, knowledge sharing. Um, I do a lot of community during projects um, and this is all over the um, UK and all over the world at the moment. Um, and I am very, very much interested in circular design, how it connects um, to materials, what we make, uh, what we do, what we uh, do with them after we've used them, um, and the sort of ethical and sustainable practice around it. So um, my background is really textiles, and it's really um, looking at um, materials from um, a kind of not a nano or micro level, but a, but, but a, but a slightly larger scale, more macro scale. Um, and what I'm doing in um, the future, or hope to be doing, is working with more um, students. Um, hopefully, um, many of you are joining in, the students that are really interested in becoming material scientists, material researchers, um, and really looking at how we can kind of like scale up materials, how we can look at them for many different uses, many different industries. Um, and really help to disseminate that knowledge within education. So I am a super fan of um, Discover Materials um, and it's really, really exciting to be with you um, all today. Um, what I kind of wanted to start with is this question about how do bioplastics and biomaterials fit into a circular economy? We had um, some great examples of um, Eleonora's, um, you know, talking about how we can actually start to use them in, in certain different industries um, and the kind of industry that I've been looking at most is the sort of physical materials um, the physical um, uh, kind of like day-to-day -day maybe materials packaging and products that we might look at um, but also how that lends itself to other industries um, that you know we use day-to-day -day. Um, and it sort of starts for me with what the um, what Becky was saying about um, sort of our production and our and the circular economy itself. So we have a model at the moment, um, and this is um, um, uh, two graphs to compare from um, the Fab City um, uh, organization. And uh, the first one is to show how we have a linear model at the moment. And so we extract from one location our resources, we move them, we process them, we distribute them to another location, we maybe even send them to another location to be um, gotten rid of as a waste. So this creates just a chain of of processes, a, a chain of, of movement of materials. It doesn't actually think about the cost of um, the, um, resources it doesn't take into consideration any human effects any effects on the environment and so it really is you know it's not really thinking ahead um, and the idea of um, circular economy in the in the sense of the say design world is that actually we can and and all many other industries is that we can fabricate um, locally and so we can fabricate in a location that is close to us um, and we can use the resources that are close to us so we can call that uh, circular fabrication in a nutshell. And this actually can help um, to support a local economy. So the local businesses, the local communities, and um, the local environment. Um, and between the, these different locations, we have what we call like a data exchange. So we would exchange the information from one location to the other. And that way we sort of advance um, a bit faster, we learn from each other's mistakes and we actually can kind of learn in a way that is um, useful and not, not, closed, not closed off and not uh, in a slow way where we're still taking a lot of time with um, the waste that is being produced and actually you know, we can learn from each other's information and, and sort of speed that up a, a bit. Um, now, 
where this sort of fits in in terms of biomaterials, and this is um, a, a graph from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, is that bioplastics and biomaterials have the potential to fit into um, a particular loop within um, our economy. So this graph is great because it shows that you can look at the technical cycles, so all the technical materials, the steels, um, the synthetic things which can be recycled um, and, and can be reused in particular industries. And we can kind of separate these uh, from what's in our biological, natural, organic loop. And so if you have a biomaterial which is 100% natural so it has no synthetics not even a percentage um, of a synthetic material inside it actually it can become part of this biological cycle and that means that not only is it helping us with our habits and and you know for that material usage that we need but also it has nutrients in it which are beneficial to the environment and so it really brings in the whole kind of life cycle you know the circle of life from uh, sort of uh, lion king sort of think think like that um, that potentially we can have materials and products that actually are supporting and not only are okay within our environment but actually they're beneficial this is the kind of area of research of where I'm coming in from. Um, and a company that I work for, um, it's a nonprofit organization called Materium. Um, what we've managed to do is be inspired by this concept that everything around us is natural, that everything around us has, has a use, that nature is constantly producing materials um, and ingredients which, which can support us. And the idea of our research and what we do is to be able to actually share that with everyone. So our contributors for our, let's say, recipe book of materials are from all over the world and they're sharing their research in a way that is is open um, and that is licensed by Creative Commons. So you have to attribute it to the person you're using the research of, but it's open for everyone to use. And this brings down a lot of barriers. And again, it will speed up that data exchange between people. And the motivation for, for this is really, as Becky explained, the circular economy um, and thinking about how we can improve that, how we can create circular loops of materials within our you know small small locations as well as the larger locations and also to make our supply chains a lot more resilient so um, when one um, thing goes wrong uh, you know we, we have a there's a backup or there's an alternative resource and we can think in a way that the systems are modular and they are changeable and again it accelerates the innovations so at materium there is a a recipe library which you can access and I'll show you later, um, a data sandbox and this is where it gets interesting for the material scientists who are excited about comparing materials and seeing um, what properties a sort of a technical material that has been used for say you know 50 years has and compare it to a new material that maybe has a um, as a biomaterial that has a has a has a different property or has um has very similar properties and what that can do and also the community so again we're supported by the community and all of this means that we can kind of downscale from massive um, industry massive um uh, locations of fabrication and we can actually think of again more locally to us what can we do at home what can we do um in our local uh, boroughs um, and it's something I guess throughout COVID that we've been getting used to what is actually closest to us we're not able, able to, to go out and what can we find that is really in our vicinity so this mentality is, is already um, starting um, and has been started. Um, and the other thing is to think about these uh, principles of circular engineering principles, so we have the circular economy. Um, and within that you'd have circular design principles, circular engineering principles, and thinking about our materials as something that is a resource, not just an end product. So the way we think of our energy as uh, some of our energy being renewable, so think solar power, wind power, um, sea power, uh, we can actually think about our materials as potentially being renewable and also being regenerative. 
And the other really big part, obviously, for, for me as a researcher, as a designer, is to be inspired by nature. And I loved um, Eleonora's um, example of the butterfly, which is something that I, I was really happy to see in actually more detail because it's, it's something I've looked at for a long time. So we use um, nature uh, as researchers, as designers, um, as inspiration. So whether it's the property of a leaf or different leaves, uh, bark, say for example, um, the elasticity and strength of a spiderweb. This is what is really inspiring us as, as designers um, and, and as scientists as well. Um, and a little drawing of mine on the right, just to say how you could maybe um, not only think about just the properties, but how you can really um, draw and actually uh, be note down what is inspiring to you about a particular plant um, or particular uh, uh, natural resource. So trying different techniques as, as ways to observe and analyze is, is a really wonderful thing as well. Just be open with it and go for it. And um, obviously within um, uh, our um, industry now in the design and science industries, we have access to a lot more technology. Um, this is a great um, project from uh, Laya, who's in um, MIT, and she created a biomaterials, 100% uh, biodegradable, 100% natural. Um, and she's used a KUKA robot, um, that's what they're called, K-U-K-A, to um, create a, a CAD design, so uh, a, a computer um, design. And this is inspired by uh, the leaves and the structure or uh, the structure of leaves and also of wings. And this has then been used to create a packaging. So not only are we thinking of what the material is made of, but actually the way in which we can uh, use it. So the processes that we put that material through. And um, of course, um, you're thinking, okay, well, how is this all natural? Well, our biomaterial ingredients that we use, that I use in my research, are part of nature. Um, and this is just a, a little um, way to show you um, that actually we can find them in different locations. So, for example, um, cellulose is in cotton, um, it's part of uh, cell walls. Um, we've got um, chitin, which is things like mollusks and seashells. And, and so we're really thinking about what is around us, what is part of nature and, and where can we use it and how, um, and how can we um, use it carefully um, and, and healthily. Um, and one thing that's really amazing to be able to show is how abundant these materials are. So it's really important that we're not extracting materials from resources that are not abundant. So we're thinking about comparing what we um, use in terms of our oil extraction and production per year, comparing these to what actually nature produces and how abundant, how much it regenerates itself and can we help support that regeneration as well. Um, and the biggest part of this, which Chris will um, know and love, um, is the uh, life-friendly chemistry and, and to not dwell on it uh, too much. And I do encourage you to have a look at the Biomimicry Institute and a, and a great video by Mark Dorfman. Um, he, it describes the fantastic um, uh, uses of life-friendly chemistry and of green chemistry and how we can use it within our designs, how we can use it within material science and how we can start to think about creating sort of more healthier processes. The, the key thing is um, with life-friendly chemistry um, that, that we use, that I use, is to do chemistry within water. So rather than using harmful chemicals, harmful solvents, things that are, are toxic, um, we try to think about using water. So using it as a solvent, as a catalyst to create the materials and, and as a building block itself. Um, and we would not be able to do this actually without um, supporters and, and you know our wider networks. You can just see a, a, a couple here that people who I've worked with, companies that I've worked with. So this really brings it into the area of the circular economy, sharing that information, seeing who is up there, seeing who is interested. And some of these people are based in the UK, some of the based in the States, some of the based in South America, some of the based in, in Asia. So it's really thinking globally um, uh, about our economy as a whole. Um, and another thing um, that um, some of the people in the, those groups and those organizations are, are doing to support um, 
to material research and biomaterial um, research um, is data generation. By that, I mean um, the properties of the materials. And so not only are we finding what the fantastic properties are, we're also um, able to um, say build the machines. And it brings in um, obviously a key core part of engineering um that we need to find out this information so we can again compare those two materials that are already existing that may be more harmful so um all of that um you can find a little bit more about that on the material website and here is a, just a really good example to show you side by side what some of the biomaterials um could look like against different materials that already exist in in industry um and i do have to uh, just again point out with the community side of things the team so you are you know hopefully thinking about being a material scientist or an engineer researcher or material designer um and and that comes all uh, under that and just to think about i just wanted to show you that there's some of the team that i work with um have a chemist we have someone who's in data development have someone who is doing um more materials characterization and and also um, just thinking about how we're using say for example waste materials so you know there's such some of the questions uh, earlier I saw one earlier about fashion which are applied to you know there is you you can study a, a particular subject and you can really get into um, it and and apply it to what you're interested in too and so there is those there are those opportunities there so do do go for it and do see um, who you connect with um, as, a, as a team and as, a, and as an individual. Um, and there's lots of projects that are going on, so many examples that I could give. There's one that we're doing in um, the EU at the moment, looking at um, wastes um, from six different cities, um, one of which is food waste um, in Milan, which is very exciting, and another one which is looking at plastics and bioplastics in Denmark, in Violet. Um, Exemplar project, which is a great one in the UK, southeast, uh, southwest, um, Biobox, which is Birmingham based, which is really exciting, and um, the Spirulina Society, which is how to grow um, your own micro algae and use that as a food source, a source of nutrition, as well as potentially use it within materials. Um, and that is coming from the UK and, and Thailand um, as, a, as, as a point of uh, the organizational. Con uh, connection um and really again the whole point of having a circular economy is so we can build the communities and, and networks um on the uh, list on on the left hand side you can see the materium um sort of team and location and contributors but also we know that there is a whole network outside um and and discover materials is is a really big uh, uh part of that so it's being able to say that we have these networks who are interested in biomaterials bioplastics um and who and how we can build this and learn from each other to build a more circular economy and one question i guess i wanted to pose and maybe we can put it in the in the chat is um do we think that bioplastics um, and the circular economy are maybe packaging or system or, or both? What is a combination of it? And I just chose sort of Oddbox as, a, as, an, a, as an example, um, because, you know, uh, essentially the, the, the cardboard, um, it's not grown on trees. It is a material that is made um, and it could have a completely natural binder. Um, but it's doing something which um, connects into um, a system of, of where the products are coming from, also where the cardboard is coming from and those resources, um, and where it's going to. So we also have to think about the system um, behind it. Um, and I really want to show you some uh, recipes. Um, so one of the things that you can do on the website on the material website for example um, is look for different recipes and some of the kind of ingredients that you know you can find at home that you can try looking at things like gelatin whether that's fish or pork or bovine um, you can look at vegan gelatin potato starch things that you would find at home and you can really start with these and all of the recipes that are on the website that and things that i have chosen to um, use and look at and explore in my research <clears throat> are using these um, home uh, home accessible ingredients. Um, this is an example of what one of the um, materials that has been developed in Chile it looks like. Um, it's made from avocado bits which are, have uh, cellulose in um, and they are starch based. Think about starches, 
maybe link it to that um, and flowers. Um, and, and it has some amazing properties. So you can see that um, it's really quite open and accessible. Um, again, I wanted to just mention that the recipes there um, are um, Creative Commons uh, licensed, so it means you can attribute it to someone. And I really, really look at, it would be really interesting to see, you know, uh, who who goes on to look at this and and how we can we can interact um, as a as a community um, and as an economy together to see how we can develop these materials, more biomaterials. Um, and I just also wanted to mention some of the tools that you can access. So again, this thing about it being accessible to all um, is, is really, really important. Um, and so the tools and equipment are, are something that um, I have tried to make as, as a researcher uh, more accessible um, and to, to minimize it down. So if you guys want to um, try some, making some biomaterials at home um, that you can, you're able to do that. Um, and you can join the Ethereum and it's free and it's very simple so you can be part of the community um, and there is uh, one thing that I thought would be really interesting for you guys is the contribution guide where you can read a little bit more about um, what is involved what is there um, you know the about the green chemistry or a little bit more about that um, and here's the one of the first recipes. Um, so this is uh, agar based. So agar is a red seaweed. Um, it's called Rhodophyta. It's uh, pretty abundant. Um, if you click on the um, agar ingredient um, on the material website, you can find a little bit more about um, uh, the ingredients themselves. Um, but this is just an overview of, of, of what a recipe looks like. And you can see you have the composition tools, but also down at the bottom, we have the properties. and that's really important for the material science. And that's really where we're going next to develop um, or to be able to test more materials um, and really put those properties down so everyone can see what their properties are. Another one that's really fun to do, um, which is very simple. So water, cornstarch, so you can think about using other starches potentially, um, and sodium bicarbonate. And it makes a sort of clay um sort of uh, play-doh like material you can add in food coloring again it's all 100 natural um as a biomaterial and you um bake this one actually as well so um you know it becomes really hard and rock like and, and it's it's a really good one to experiment with and do tests with as uh, chris will um know <laughs> um Another one for maybe someone who's um, and thinking about the uh, fashion question, which I'm, I'm glad came up, is uh, natural dyes. Um, we don't often think about um, dyes and inks and paints as materials, um, but they are. Um, and so this is there's a few dyes as well and other inks and things that you can also explore on the website. Um, and another one which brings in the waste, um, I'm sure and probably supposed to be finishing soon um you'll have to tell me uh, chris um is um using coffee waste so again things that we can find at home um things that you can collect up you can store you can test and if it doesn't work out you can see it's a hundred percent natural material so you can also at small scale you can you can compost it and it does differ to um the sort of bioplastics that um you you would find in say supermarkets um you know the biomaterial bags and they do take a lot longer they do need industrial um uh, composting a lot of the time because they need to be at a sort of 50 degree uh, centigrade temperature um and so how we use these materials is is going to be really interesting and in how we change from um the the materials that we're using at the moment to the materials that we could be using in the future um, and how we can explore and understand them and so this is hopefully a tool for you to be able to think about where the materials are coming from and being able to create them yourselves is, is a big part of it um, and that's it for now i can i could do say more but i won't um you let me know if i should stop sharing chris and if there's any questions Well, thank you very much, Zoe. That was fascinating to sort of see um, the breadth of the materials you can just make at home yeah. in the kitchen that's around in the garden or you can buy in the supermarket. And also it's really interesting um, to sort of see that you don't need a background in material science and engineering to be involved as a material scientist. To do material science, this is and true. It just, it, I think it just sort of exemplifies what I've sort of 
wide ranging all encompassing science it is yeah. uh, it's so many facets to it yeah. um, has well, i'm anyone... getting there one day yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll have that official <laughs> and i've actually got one of the bio boxes here that you mentioned uh, so yeah. yes yeah. i've got one there and um, yeah we as if, is there any questions for zoe at all if you don't have any now you can always um like message me like i said yeah, with each and... other and with the um, materials testing um, sort of at home with the bio box that we're doing at, at Birmingham, this, um, we're sort of piloting it with third year dental students and there's yeah, some interesting setups and results coming through from that, so that'll be interesting yeah. to see where they get with that. Yeah. 